tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where you are to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, twill be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we shan't be ashamed to turn. Turn will be our delight, till by turning, turning we come round right. Tis the gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where you want to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, we'll be in the valley of love and delight. To turn, turn will be our delight till by turn. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. God of the covenant, in our baptism, you call us to proclaim the coming of your kingdom. Give us the courage you gave the apostles, that we may faithfully witness to your love and peace in every circumstance of life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first lesson is a reading from Amos. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. 
Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. To the Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose in us Christ before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. King Herod heard the disciples preaching, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying John the baptizer had been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said it is Elijah, and others said it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard it, he said, John, who I am beheaded, has been raised has been raised. For Herod himself sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on the name of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came for Her when Herod had his birthday and gave a banquet for his courtiers and officials, and the leaders of gallery, when his daughter Herodias came in and danced. She pleased Herod and his guests, and the king said to the girl, ask me for anything you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. And so she went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was grieved and yet out of regard for his oaths and for his guests, he did not refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in prison. He brought the head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Good morning, Holy Cross. I uh, was going to just have a nap time and record this with a sleeping baby, but we have a wake baby, so he's going to join us for the sermon today. Say hi. So I got a text from Pastor John asking if I'd be up to giving the message this week. Sure, I said. Great, he replied. I'll send you the verses. I quickly read the verses and thought, well played, Pastor John, well played. Usually, I focus on the gospel lesson and only glance at the other verses for a given week. But this week, well, do I really want to preach on this? The beheading of John the Baptist? Ugh. This must be one of the most unfavorite gospel lessons to preach on. 
I see you, Pastor John. I see you. So in an effort to avoid this text, I turn to our Old Testament reading. Ah, Amos. I have a place in my heart for Amos, the rabble-rouser prophet who preaches social justice. He makes great Lent material. He was a prophet in the time of King Jeroboam II, which was one of the most prosperous periods of Jewish history. And yet, Amos was a bit of a sore thumb. He reminded Israel of their social injustice, their treatment of the poor, selfishness, and their lack of obedience to God. Here in today's Old Testament reading, we get a little peek into Amos's life. Amos puts it out there that God isn't happy with Israel, and he reigns on the parade of the current prosperity era. And as we might have guessed, the establishment tells Amos, hey, move on, go preach it somewhere else. An interesting tidbit that I learned while preparing this message is that in the time of Amos, there were professional prophets. They generally avoid talking about political leaders and had flowery things to say about Israel. So the priest comes out to Amos and says, hey, 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 take your show elsewhere. We aren't buying it. And Amos responds like, hey man, I'm not one of your guys. I'm just a shepherd, man. I'm not here for the money. There's a lot about Amos, uh, Israel during the time of Amos that reminds me of America today. There was a lot of prosperity gospel. And it's really hard to sell God who cares about the poor and the outcast when others are saying that God blesses the good people. It's hard to hear that putting yourself first isn't what God wants. It's hard to hear, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind and all your soul and love your neighbor as well as yourself. So, okay, speaking God's word can be unpopular. And in the case of John, speaking truth to power can get you killed. So moving on to the epistle lesson, maybe I can find a more comfortable message there. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished upon us with all wisdom and insight. He has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Lavish grace, all wisdom, being gathered up with the things of heaven and earth. Yes, this is what I'm talking about. Sandwiched between these two difficult messages about getting in trouble for sharing hard words from God is a glorious gospel message that reminds us that we are children of God, inheritors of the kingdom, and that in the fullness of time, all things will be gathered unto him. I think I would like to make my sermon today about this lesson of grace. But if I'm going to be honest, I have a hard time with Paul's letters. I mean, I kind of just glaze over when I read them. There's too many prepositional phrases. I have to read and reread to try to grasp what is by what, through what, according to what. And I feel, I feel so much like I'm just reading this translation. I, I want to build a message around this passage the good news, but I can't get my head around what Paul is saying. So I decided to look up the message version. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the message. It is a translation of the Bible done by Eugene Patterson, a pastor who wanted to share the Bible with his congregation in a more authentically English way. Many translations are done by committees who are focused on getting the most authentic or accurate or literal um, meanings, words conveyed in the original text while still making it readable in English. But often, when you try to translate text as accurately as you can, you lose some of the feel of the original language. Like try translating the phrase, I'm cool with that, or that's hella far. Unless you have a deeply fluent translator, some of the feel of the original intent is going to get left behind. 
So we have Paul, who's this amazing missionary, evangelist, and writer, who shared his words far and wide through these letters, and they became canon. They were so powerful. And often when I read these letters, though, they feel dense and impersonal. Maybe they were. But I like to check out the message version, not to nitpick over what Paul is saying, but more to try to understand and feel his tone. So here are a few excerpts from today's reading. You got something to say? Long before he laid down the earth's foundations, he had us in mind. He settled on us as the focus of his love and made us whole and holy by his love. Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. Because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, his blood poured out on the altar of the cross. We are a free people, free of penalties and punishment, chalked up by all our misdeeds, and not just barely free either abundantly free. He thought of everything, <laughs> paid for everything, letting us in on the plans that he took delight in making. <clears throat> it's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eyes on us. He had designs on us for glorious living, part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and everyone. This letter paints a picture of, who, of a God who loves us all, who seeks us all, who gives us everything and gathers everything into himself. Together with the other verses, I felt like this ties up into a nice, neat message. I can start imagining myself as belonging to God. I'm living my life. I'm trying my best to seek God's hand and work in this world. This letter from Paul can give me courage to speak truth to power when the opportunity arises, to remind myself not to be complacent in the consumer society that I live in, to hold on to the ethics, and if need be, stand up and be a whistleblower in organizations or circles that I walk in. Maybe it would get me in trouble, but my God, my bigger God, walks with me and draws me unto himself. I felt good about this message. I let it sit in my heart for a few days, but something, something just nagged at me. You know, it's easy for me to empathize with the good guys, with Amos and John the Baptist, to see myself in them. But a knocking at my heart begged me to reconsider this week's scripture by empathizing with the bad guys. After all, human nature is to push back against being called out, to bend the truth and circumstance to fit our agenda and our comfort. The children of Israel were God's chosen people. Why wouldn't he bless them with a period of prosperity? They were settled in the promised land, just as he had promised. And it's easy for us now to look back and criticize their lack of care for the poor or their abandonment of God's law or failing to worship God as he had commanded, but really, how well are we doing at that? How do we handle messages calling us to repentance or to social justice or caring for the outcast in our society? Would I really be on the side of Amos, or would I be on the side of the establishment? Let's look at Herod's wife. Why not move up in life? Her husband's brother was powerful. She was beautiful. Why not trade in one brother for a better one? And in the process, teach your daughter how to smash the patriarchy. Use what you've got to get power. I've made it a practice to not delete anyone on Facebook who posts things different from what I think. I, I make it a point to stop and pause and consider the viewpoints that are different from mine. It is a hard practice. It is an uncomfortable practice. And this past year has been particularly so as it's been a politically polarizing year. America seems to be breaking down into tribes. We and they, us and them, we and us against they and them, speaking truth to they and them. Of course, the easiest course of action is to think, hey, move on, Amos. I don't got time for your memes. I'm not always that lone voice using my courage to speak up when it is unpopular to do so. Sometimes I'm actually with the majority and I'd rather not be bothered with a dissenting voice. 
But other times, I look and I see things that I cannot ignore, and my heart breaks for the oppressed, the weary, the sick, and I cannot continue on my same path. I am changed by the world's need. And in the words of Luther, here I stand, I can do no other. Sometimes I am called to follow in the footsteps of John the Baptist, and sometimes I'm tempted by the path of Herodias. This is my Lutheran conviction. I am both sinner and saint, sanctified and condemned. So with this heart, I return to Paul's letter. It is in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Part of the overall purpose that he is working out in everything and everyone. I've been listening to a book called Love Does, and it talks about how faith pushes us to love and how love can push us to do ridiculous things. One of my favorite <coughs> stories from the book is that of a young man who wanted to propose to his fiance. They often walked a trail by the bay, and the author of the, uh, of the book owned a house right on the waterfront. He enjoyed sitting out on his back porch and watching the people stroll along the bay trail. So one day, the young man comes up to him and asks if he could have dinner with his fiancee on the porch and propose to her. The author agreed, smiling at himself at how bold the young man had been to go up to a complete stranger and ask to have dinner on her porch. Love pushes you to do crazy things. A few days later, the young man returned and asked if a few friends could serve the dinner. <coughs> smiling, the author agreed. A few days later, the young man again returned with the gall to ask if the author had a boat and if he could use it. He in fact did have a boat and he's chuckled at how bold this young man had grown. But the author caught up in the moment, decided to be bold himself, and he placed a call to the Coast Guard, explained the whole story and asked on the behalf of the young lover if they would shoot water cannons off for the young couple in celebration of the engagement. As a sinner and as a saint, my focus is to set my eyes on Jesus. In Christ, I find life. In life, I find love. And in love, I find purpose and courage. Maybe in love, I will get caught up in a ridiculous caper, not knowing what I am doing or asking, not realizing that I've overstepped my bounds because love is driving me to set aside notions of how I should or shouldn't be. Maybe it will get me in trouble or maybe it will inspire others to join me. Maybe faith will give me the courage to step up and speak that life and love into the world, even when no one else seems to notice or care about a blaring injustice. Maybe that courage will allow me to set my ego aside and listen, really listen to a rebuke or a call to repentance. I think to look into a mirror and to admit and to name the dark parts of myself may be the boldest of all. These scriptures serve as a sort of bumper and they continually ask me, am I shrinking back from a call to speak up, to love with reckless abandon, or am I leaning into my own agenda and <coughs> for my own benefit? Am I living out Christ's purpose for my life today, right this moment? Working out is every day in every one of us until, as the scriptures say, the fullness of time when all things will be revealed. Until then, we can cling to this amazing gospel that God has known and loved each one of us since before time. That grace is lavishly, richly lavished upon us before we deserve it or ask for it. And that our God is abundant in love and forgiveness. And all of this broken creation will one day be drawn unto God and made whole. But until then, may we find courage to live a life led by love. Oh, he 
Let us come before the triune God in prayer. God of all, through the waters of baptism, you claim people of all races, ethnicities, and languages as your beloved children. Sustain the baptized and increase their faith, that your gospel may be proclaimed throughout the earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of the heavens, your creating spirit animates the universe. We give you thanks for the moon and stars for the planets and the Milky Way galaxy, and for all of the mysteries of the cosmos that remain unknown to us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of freedom, you have liberated us from sin and death and rescue us from all forms of spiritual, social, and political oppression. Defend us from tyrants in our midst and deliver us from all forms of slavery and corruption. Direct our freedom for works of liberation and wholeness. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. God of compassion, you became vulnerable in the person of Jesus Christ in solidarity with the disempowered. Strengthen those who feel faint, give courage to those who fear, and bring wholeness to those in need, especially those we name aloud or in the silence of our heart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of holiness, you send us out into this world to proclaim your love. We pray for our outreach ministries like the Shemin Lavi Mio Project, Haitian Education Leadership Program, Open Heart Kitchen, Livermore Homeless Refuge, and the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights. Equip us as we leave this place to witness and serve our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks that in every time and place you call forth prophets who move us towards freedom. Thank you for those who work for human rights, community organizers, and all who strive for liberty for all. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always, and also with you. Share that sign of peace with one another. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our honor and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of might and power, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy, holy Lord God, God of might and power, holy is the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna here on earth. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna here on earth. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love, you sent to us, Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who, on the cross, opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. 
Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. These are the fruits of God for the people of God. Come to the table. All are welcome. For the gifts of God are free. Amen. And dead in my sin Lost without hope With no place to begin Your love made a way To let mercy come in When death was rested And my life began Ash was redeemed Only beauty remained and heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began.
Let us pray. Gracious God, in this meal, you have drawn us to your heart and nourished us at your table with food and drink, the body and blood of Christ. Now send us forth to be your people in the world and to proclaim your truth this day and evermore. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.